Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you all back to another episode of the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm so thankful that you're here to join me today. And we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is so very important for those of us that have faced brokenness within the church and within our own personal Christian lives. And that is the topic of the doctrine of God, Trinitarian Orthodoxy, and some of the teachings that come from misunderstanding God, the Trinity, things like EFS, ESS. We're going to define those terms for some of you. I have a feeling a lot of you that are regular listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. But I wanted to have a guest on on this subject that is very well versed in these issues and that is really trying to steer us in the right direction when it comes to what the historic Christian faith and Protestantism says about this very thing, about Trinitarian Orthodoxy and the importance of it and the doctrine of God. And so I am so blessed and grateful to have a man of this caliber on my podcast, and that is Dr. Matthew Barrett, who is a professor of Christian theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is also the founder and editor-in-chief of Credo Magazine, a publication that retrieves classical theology for the sake of cultivating reformation in the church today. He is the host of the Credo Podcast, and he is the director of the Center for Classical Theology. He is also currently writing a systematic theology as well as a doctrine of God for Baker Academic. And he is the author of Simple Trinity, the Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit, which won the Christianity Today Book of the Year Award in Theology. And he is also the author of The Reformation as Renewal, None Greater, The Undomesticated Attributes of God, God's Word Alone, and Canon, Covenant, and Christology. He is originally from California. He received his BA from Biola University in California, and he received his Master of Divinity and PhD in Systematic Theology from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, close to where I'm at in Louisville, Kentucky. And prior to Midwestern, he was the lecturer of Systematic Theology in London, England at Oak Hill College and Assistant Professor of Christian Studies at California Baptist University. During his time in California, he was also the senior pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church. Dr. Barrett is passionate about the retrieval of classical theology and loves nothing more than seeing his students embrace and embody the confessional theology of Reformed Orthodoxy. He is a theologian with a pastor's heart, always eager to demonstrate how doctrine leads to doxology. He's married to his wife, Elizabeth, and they have four children. And they love Kansas City Barbecue, Rooting for the Chiefs, which we just talked about before. Uh, we started this podcast. They just won in the playoffs, so he's very happy. And the Jayhawks, and he was born in L.A., and so he's also a diehard Lakers fan. And you can subscribe to his newsletter where he gives regular updates on his writing, and you can also subscribe to Credo and keep up with the podcast and videos. And so, Dr. Barrett, it is a honor and a privilege to have you on the Broken Vessels podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a real privilege, and thank you for that very generous introduction. You bet. Well, brother, let's go ahead and jump right into talking about these very important issues. So, first of all, I'd like you, if you would, to explain to our listeners what Doctrine of God and Trinitarian Orthodoxy is and why it is so important to the Church, both historically and now. Yeah, it is incredibly important. It's odd to have to say this today, isn't it? Because very much. <laughs> and yeah, in past centuries, us having this conversation might have sounded strange to many Christians because they would have said, well, what do you mean? Of course we believe in orthodoxy. That's synonymous with what it means to be a Christian mm-hmm. and a confessing one at that. But, you know, we're in the aftermath of modernism 
and modern theology as well, and it's had quite an effect on the church. And I think sometimes we like to think that we are immune from that, but if we know our history, the church today has been influenced and affected, whether it's intentionally or not, in all kinds of ways, including the doctrine of God and matters of orthodoxy. Mm. And so, goodness, we could think of so many examples. You know, if you walk into an average church today and ask them, what is the eternal generation? Or do you believe in the immutability or impassibility of God? You will get some strange looks, yeah. no doubt. But in a prior era, confessing the doctrine of God was something that was done every Sunday morning. Mm. Sometimes it was confessing the Nicene Creed together. Other times it came out in the preaching of the Word. So whether it's the liturgy at large or specific efforts at Cassis, Christians were trained in just the basics of orthodoxy. Unfortunately, today that's no longer the case, yeah. sadly. And so we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in which I really do think that the task of many in the next generation will be to recover and retrieve orthodoxy itself to bring about renewal in the church. Mm. You asked, why is it so important? I don't think I'm overstating this when I say, if you get the doctrine of God wrong, everything else is affected Yeah, in the worst way possible. Yeah. So I know sometimes we're taught theology as, as if it's this, every bit of it is partitioned off and we sort of select whatever view we like, but actually it doesn't work that way. What you believe about God has a way of influencing everything else you believe from Christology to sociology to eschatology and more. Yeah, you can definitely see everything that you're talking about. I mean, I've seen it firsthand in churches I've been yeah. a part of, but I mean, you certainly see it in the social media spheres and the kind of debates and discussions that are going on in the so-called Christian public square and even beyond. And it's concerning because these things trickle down into our churches and they affect people's actual lives and the way, I mean, and we're going to get into this a little further down in our discussion, but it goes down to the rubber meets the road level in marriages and relationships yeah. and all of those things. Well, let, mm. let me ask you this. What are some of the heretical and heterodox views, which we've defined those terms for our listeners in the past, but yeah. concerning the Trinity that made defining and defending it so important to the historical church? Because like you said, this is not a conversation we would have been having maybe even 200 years ago. I mean, it just is, mm -hmm. they'd be like, no brainer guys, but here we are having to have it. <laughs> That's because... Yeah. They dealt with these heresies and heterodox views in the past. Now we're seeing reiterations of that. We're going to get into that as well. But mm -hmm. kind of explain to our listeners some of these views that we've fought for in the past that now we're having to come back and fight for again. Yeah, it's so fascinating. When you read the church fathers, for example, they are experiencing such turmoil. Yeah, And it can be a help to us today because sometimes in the midst of all of the tension and erroneous positions today, you can lose heart. You really can. Yeah. And it yeah. can be comforting in a strange way to go back to the church fathers and realize, especially when you read their letters to each other and discover wow, there were points they were not sure if orthodoxy as they knew it would survive. Mm. And so I think the first thing I want to say is, praise God, he's been so faithful preserve his church. Amen to that. From one generation to another, sometimes in the midst of seemingly hopeless circumstances. If we go back to the fourth century, for example, one of the major challenges that the church faces is the rise of different strands of subordinationism. Hmm. In a nutshell, this would be any attempt to interpret the scriptures in a way that would view Christ himself as if he is less than the Father. And that could be less than the Father in glory, power, authority. All of these are just different words of describing the divine essence of God. Mm -hmm. And those who know some church history will remember that Arianism is right at the center of this controversy in which all of a sudden the unity between the Father and the Son is thrown into question. Yeah. Uh, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the Arian controversy, that was just controversy over the deity of Christ. Well, there's truth to that, but it really was so much more. It was a debate over the Trinity itself, not just 
Christ, but Trinitarian Orthodoxy as we know it today. And so the rise of Arianism posed a major threat. The Arians said, well, the Son may be one with the Father in will, but he is one with the Father in being or divine essence. And that proved to be the dividing line. Mm. Because this is what's so fascinating. Both the Arians and the Church Fathers both assumed certain attributes were true of God. God is immutable. He does not change. God is impassable. He doesn't have paths. Uh, God is simple. He is without parts and so on. But when they made that move to then explain, okay, who is Christ then? Yeah. Uh, suddenly there's a divide because the Arians said, well, Christ must be the mediating deity, so to speak, between God and creation that then explain why God could have contact with creation without corrupting himself. And so, of course, then the Son had to be the greatest of all that was made, but nonetheless, still less than the Father. Mm. It had all kinds of implications. You see it when the Fathers write the Nicene Creed in that simple phrase, be then not made. In other words, for the Church Fathers, they realized the Arians were rejecting the eternal generation of the Son, as it's called. And in order to counter that move, it became essential to go back to the Scriptures to recognize, well, Scripture teaches that the Son is distinguished. It's almost too basic to say, right? What, what it, why is He Son, and why is the Father called Father? Well, because He's begotten. That's mm-hmm. what a Son is. The Father's Father, because He begets. But unlike our experience, this is an eternal begetting that takes place, so that it eliminates any type of limitations that the Arians tried to impose, such as change and so much more. So this became really important because, yes, it distinguished the Son, but at the same time, they put it right there in the Nicene Creed, the doctrine, because it also safeguards and protects and ensures the equality or what we call the consubstantiality of the Son and the Father. So, yes, he's begotten, that's why he's Son, and the Father is called Father, but he's begotten from the Father's divine essence. So all the perfection and beauty and glory of the divine essence is communicated from the Father to the Son, from all eternity, without time, without change, and This became a pivotal moment in the history of the church because the church fathers and the church gathered at Nicaea to say, well, if this is true, then the Son is begotten, but He's not made. And He's true God from true God. And then they really built on the biblical language of He's light, light from light. All these beautiful ways, you see a lot of these in the Gospel of John. So all that to say, subordinationism, I could go on. There were many variants of subordinationism that then branched off from there, some more radical than others. Right. But it really did pose a major threat to the survival of Trinitarian Christianity. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I got so many questions <laughs> as you talk about this, because it's like, man, this is like at the core of a lot of the stuff I see in the church today. But let's go ahead and talk about how these views— that affected the church historically, what was the trickle-down effect? We kind of alluded to that at the beginning. The trickle-down effect on other very important doctrines, because like you said, if you don't get the doctrine of God right, everything else just falls apart. So things like sola Mm -hmm. fide and all of these things. So let's talk about that a little bit. Goodness, there's so many things we could mention, right? I think the first thing I would mention, and this is sometimes forgotten as well when you go back in time and these ancient debates. One of the things that is really the debate behind the debate is how to read the Bible. Yeah. This is, in a sense, the debate over the Trinity in the fourth century and then future centuries after. It really comes down to hermeneutics. Mm. So many of these Arians and different types of subordinationists were reading the Bible in what I would call a biblicist manner. Yeah. Now, that word, you know, I don't know if listeners know what. Oh, yeah. What to make of that word. They They're know exactly different. what you're talking about because we've talked about biblicism yeah. quite a bit on this program. So, yeah, I mean, that's so encouraging to hear. There's a difference between believing in biblical authority Amen. and being biblicist, mm-hmm. in which you would read the scriptures, for example, in a very literalistic fashion that could do real harm to, say, the doctrine of the Trinity. Just, so, just to give an example of this, the Arians would come to certain texts in Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament, and would read those texts as if what is said about Jesus in the Incarnation, 
should be mapped right on to our conclusions about the Trinity. And yeah. that had some really negative consequences because at that point you're reading about the mission of Jesus in which he is suffering and he is going to the cross, he's obeying the law, and so on and so on, if that swallows up everything, well, suddenly you really don't have a place then for who is this Jesus apart from creation. Yeah. And so naturally they conclude, well, once the son was not, it was just unfathomable to them to think of a son who is begotten from the father from all eternity apart apart from the created order and uh, what that means for him. So all that to say, biblical interpretation was really at the core of this. It's remarkable to this day how that continues. Yeah, It's with the rise of, say, theology, there's been what you would call a conflation between God in and of himself and God towards creation and all the works he accomplishes in time and history for our sake. There's a conflation of those categories. We see it in the last century with the rise, for example, of canonic Christology, in which suddenly in order for the Son of God to become incarnate, well, there's this tension all of a sudden that he must have to abandon certain divine attributes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the incarnation is inexplicable. So this conflation of these categories has devastating consequences, both for how we read the Bible as well as other doctrines such as Christology. I'll just mention one more. It has huge implications for soteriology and doxology in the church. It's not a surprise that in the 4th century, many of these Trinitarian wars, you could see it practically in the way that they worshipped. I mean, one way to look at it is what songs and hymns were they writing and singing? And it's not a surprise, historians have dug this up now, that, well, there's real differences. Those subordinationists were not willing to worship Jesus as they did the Father. Hmm. And likewise, this then carry over in future decades between, you know, the 320s and the 380s with the Holy Spirit, uh, in which suddenly this whole debate recycles itself, but now with the Holy Spirit as well. Is the Holy Spirit subordinate? Yeah. And then, of course, salvation with it. Athanasius is quite famous for raising this issue. If the Son is not begotten from the Father before all time, as the Nicene Creed says, on what basis can he redeem us? So, as you can see, and I should just mention for Athanasius that meant not just that we need any type of mediator, but we need a mediator who is the God himself. Amen. Um, And this became foundational. You think of the medieval period in which Anselm, he writes his fame, Why God Became Man, and is able to assume so much of this as he makes a very powerful argument that's Trinitarian and Christological, but of course has huge implications for salvation. Amen. If you don't have the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, who is God himself that has come to this earth, and like 1 Corinthians 15 says, I mean, we have no hope, (laughs) no hope at all, Mm. if we don't have a Savior that is all God as well as man that can save us. And, And you cannot separate God from the essence of who he is. I mean, it's just, it's so important. And I I mean, really understanding the simplicity of it, the fact that everybody Mm. wants to complicate everything. And that's why I appreciate your emphasizing the simplicity of God. And even though it's simple, it's so deep and so profound and so wonderful. So we have begun to see some of these same old heresies resurrected. We've been talking, I mean, you're talking about subordinationism and it's different facets and forms. Well, we have seen that big time in our day and time through EFS, ESS, which is eternal functional subordination of the sun, eternal subordination of the sun. So what I'd like you to do is if you could define what EFS is for our listeners, and then let's talk about the actual brokenness, practically speaking that we've seen this doctrine bringing to the church? Because it's a hot topic, it's a hot-button debate, but it's very important. Let's go ahead and talk about that. So I've written a book called Complete Trinity, The Unmanipulated Father, Son, Spirit, and the whole book is in about this issue. Chapter by chapter, I, I work through just biblical Trinitarianism and look at how the Church Fathers, in particular, defended biblical Trinitarianism. But towards the end of the book, in one chapter in particular, chapter 8, I do 
deal with this head on because we do live in the 20th century in which we face this challenge of evangelicals that have taught this view called eternal functional subordination or submission. And I think the important thing to understand, because sometimes folks jump right into debating this and they don't realize where this is coming from. Yeah. So just to provide a little bit of background here, it's not coming out of nowhere. Yeah. (laughs) That's the first thing to understand. If you go back to the 20th century, there is a massive push. The major modern theologians of the 20th century are pushing for what's called a social trinity. Hmm. And this is quite radically different from the trinity of, say, Nicaea, the trinity of the Nicene Creed. I would argue quite different from the trinity of the scriptures as well. Yeah. So just to give you one example here, you know, what's at the core of this new modern understanding of the Trinity? Well, the church fathers were very careful to think of the Trinity, yes, in terms of what distinguishes the persons. So we call these eternal relations of origin. It is what it sounds like. Why do we call the Father, Father, and the Son, Son? Well, the Son is begotten from the Father from all eternity. So this is the Son's eternal relation of origin from the Father. And likewise, we could go on and talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son from all eternity. The Spirit is breathed out. This is some of the scriptural language, breathed out by the Father and the Son, but from all eternity. So the Spirit has an eternal relation of origin from the Father and the Son. But the church fathers were also really careful looking at scripture to say, well, that alone distinguishes the persons. Right didn't want to insert anything else in there because they didn't believe Scripture gave warrant for that. Mm -hmm. But then simultaneously, they said, we have to emphasize what unites these persons so that Jesus can say, for example, in John 1, that he is one with the Father. Right. And they said, well, this is where divine simplicity, which doesn't mean God is, you know, basic or easy to understand, It rather means that God is without parts. He's not made up of or compounded by parts like we are. Right. Uh, A very creaturely thing, but he is not. And so that means that these persons aren't parts of God, but rather they share the one common divine essence with one another. Technical language for this is that Father, Son, and Spirit, they subsist in the same undivided divine essence from all eternity. So this was just basic Christian orthodoxy, but uh, with the rise of the 20th century, much of this was thrown into question. There was a push to define the Trinity in social categories instead. Instead of these eternal relations of origin, instead they wanted to define Father, Son, Spirit by relationships in a very modern social understanding of that word, Hmm. how they cooperate with one another like people in a society do. Why do you think that is? Do you think it was like a knee-jerk reaction to liberalism and feminism and things like that? Is that why they started doing this, I guess, is a question I'd have. Yeah, that's a, boy, that's a hard question and a complicated one. I would say it depends on the theologian. It really does. If you look at someone like Jürgen Moltmann, most prominent theologians of the last century. He's quite conspicuous about his motives. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he very much is reacting against someone like Karl Barth, and he and others, he's not the only one, but he and others were quite reactionary against this understanding of a deity that is a monarch and one and sovereign. So there's some pushback there. There's also, I would say, a misreading of history that's happening at the same time. So among other social Trinitarians, they go back to the East and they buy into a certain narrative that Mm -hmm. says, well, the East, that's where it's at because they really emphasis on the threeness, that there's a plurality of persons. And unfortunately, and they really blame Augustine for this. They, unfortunately, in the West, that was compromised because there's this emphasis on divine simplicity and the unity of God instead. Yeah. So the irony of this whole thing, they believe that they are actually bringing about in the 20th century a Trinitarian revival. But in the end, historians by the 21st century have started to ask, well, what kind of Trinitarianism was it, though? And I think many have concluded by now it's not revival of Nicene Trinitarianism, as some have thought. And one of the reasons for this is because, you know, that word social, it kind of gives it away. They're not so hot on, say, the simplicity of the Trinity. 
And so one of the consequences is that they think of persons in terms of a social societal dynamic in which their willful cooperation is what finds them. And so some of the strongest social Trinitarians will go so far to say there are three wills in the Trinity. There are three centers of consciousness. This is a radical departure from before because in the history of the church, God is one. The Trinity is one in essence, one in will, yeah. one in power and glory. The Athens Creed, listeners can Google it, you pull it up. It's a beautiful example of this. They recognize, yes, the Father is Lord and the Son is Lord and the Holy Spirit is Lord, but there's one Lord. <laughs> and they start working their way down. It's a beautiful preservation of that truth. That's uh, dispensed with in the, the 20th century. And so by consequence, one of the things that happens is suddenly it's brilliant, right? From their perspective, at least, because now if Trinity is a social Trinity in which each person is its own individual with its own will, its own center of consciousness, and the units they have with one another is, is a cooperative unity, well, now we have a paradigm, they say, for any number of things in society. And so it's not surprising that, you know, someone like Moltmann, he puts his foot on the pedal there and accelerates this program for a certain political philosophy he has. Others will do it with any number of things, ecology. Others will do it with gender as well. So I give this all as background because when EFS suddenly pops up <laughs> yeah. in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and then really starts to flourish in the 90s and 2000s and continues to this day to be taught all over the place and published in your textbooks. Well, it might be tempting to think, oh, this is just Bible. But actually, if you pay attention to its language, it's using the language of social Trinitarianism. How much they're aware mm-hmm. of that or not, it would be interesting to find out. Yeah, that but, was going to be my uh, other question, because I can understand yeah. some of the liberal theologians of, say, the 19th, 20th century being social Trinitarians. But I feel like a lot of the guys I hear pushing EFS right now, they would cringe at being called a social Trinitarian, (laughs) you know, but yet it seems like practically that's what they're doing. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think historians will look back and with some time in between all of this, I think they will look back and realize this is a uh, branch within social Trinitarianism. Social Trinitarianism can be very diverse, and that's why it's very hard to nail to the wall. But it's very clear on many of these type of commitments. They're using very much the same vocabulary. Another way to look at this is we're all influenced in different ways. Now, sometimes those influences on us are direct. Right. You know, I pick up a book and I'm reading, you know, to John Owen and I'm learning from him and I'm pulling from his insights into my own. Well, that's a very direct influence. But we also have to realize we are influenced in a much broader way. The churches we grow up in, the general atmosphere of conversations that take place among evangelicals, the songs we sing. Uh, The assumptions that are just taught to us about everything from God to marriage to church. All of this informs us very early on. And so one of the things I say in my book, Simply Trinity, is don't look at it so much as, oh, did they read this book, that book, or talk to this theologian or that theologian. Once you get to the 20th century and you have a Moltmann and a Karl Rahner, a Leonardo Boff, and, and so many others, Myrosov, Wolf, it becomes the dome. You know, you think of a, a football arena. We were talking about the, you know, the Chiefs game yeah. before we jumped on here. Arrowhead doesn't have a dome, but, but uh, I think the Cowboys do, for example. Right. Yeah, when you live in that dome, it's the air you breathe. To switch illustrations here, I, I used to live in Los Angeles, and when you are getting a, a, a you know tacos from the taco truck or you know going to the beach, life is fine. You know what's the problem? But then when you get out of Los Angeles, maybe you go on a road trip, go camping, and then come back. You come down to the pallet. You can see it. You can see the smog. smog. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a truck driver and I used to drive in California and I can, oh, yeah. I can tell you when you come down, yeah. whether you're on I-80 or I-15 and you're coming down into that valley, it is just a yeah. haze all over the place. It's the air you breathe and yeah. you don't notice it when you're in it, but when you separate yourself from it and then suddenly have, you know, a bird's eye perspective, suddenly you see it and it's like, wow, why did I not see this before? Yeah. That is very much, I think, what's happened in the last 50 years is EFS has been taught as if it's just Bible and Sunday school class. 
seminary classes. It's been given to us in books. It's been, we could talk about this further, but it's been taught from a certain hermeneutic as well. This is just how you read your Bible. And so. Yeah, I agree with you on that. It's taught in the way we approach marriage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, it, well, like you say, you know, and it very, like all of the people that I have talked to, people that I have in my life and relationships that I've been in, we've all been affected by this teaching at some point oh, yeah. in our yeah. doctrinal journey. And and I really think at the core of it is bad hermeneutics and being biblicists. Yeah. It really is. And which, you know, we talked a little bit before the program, why, man, what you're doing, brother, <laughs> to bring light to these issues when it comes to the doctrine of God and the Trinity, that's why this is so important. Like you said at the beginning, this should not be a conversation we're having right now. <laughs> I mean, in the church, but here we are. It's important. Yeah. And I really want to dig down into the second part of this section of the discussion, the brokenness, because that's what my podcast is about. Broken vessels. We're talking about theological themes for the broken to bring hope and encouragement in Christ. Christ, who is Christ? Christ is God. He is fully God, fully man, but he is God. And he is no different than the father in his deity. And I mean, that is simple and it's so important but it's so profound and it has a lot of implications. Yeah. So I want to talk about, well, we can talk about patriarchalism. I've, I've already had a whole program on that subject, but we talked about on that program, what I consider to be kind of like the redheaded stepchild of patriarchalism and that's complementarianism. <laughs> and I mean, I've been pretty honest. I mean, I don't know where I land in the spectrum. I mean, some might call me like soft complementarian. I definitely am not big C complementarian, but a lot of this comes down to me having to work through a lot of things that I know mm -hmm. are things that I've had to question things that yeah. I, I came from an independent fundamental Baptist background. I mean, that's some of the most patriarchal complementarian people you ever meet in your life. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm having a real hard time with when it comes to the way, like you said, like the way we are in church defining gender roles and and I've seen this affect not only my marriage in the past, but other marriages I've seen affected by this and not only that, but parenting and just relationship in general. And it all comes from a faulty premise at the core. And that is eternal functional subordination. Yeah. That is what seems to be at the basis. I mean, I'm not going to call the dude's name because everybody wants to name drop this guy, but a certain well-known so-called theologian threw out on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it recently, the son is subordination, the father is authority. I mean, that right mm -hmm. there. And people like slatch onto that and yeah. it just starts this whole conversation. And those of us that are way up at the top of the mountain, looking down in the valley and see the smog and see all the people breathing it, we want there yeah. to be clarity. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about the implications when it comes to complementarianism yeah. and those kinds of things. I think, you know, something really insightful you mentioned is, I think, especially for the person in the pew, one of the reasons that this latch on to this is because they haven't been taught to read their Bible in yeah. a way that pays yeah. attention to anything beyond salvation. Yeah. Now, don't mishear me. The Bible is first and foremost given to us for the sake of our salvation, and praise God for that. Amen. The New Testament epistles example, are written for many reasons, but this is maybe the big one, right, is yeah. to teach us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we praise God for that. However, in very good, you know, sometimes out of good motives, we can really slip up and assume that when we're reading our Bible, everything about who God is, is just somehow confined to, circumscribed by what takes place in time and space and history. Mm. And that's very convenient for us, very, very self-centered when we think about it. Amen. But all you have to do is open John 1 to realize before you can get to verses 14, 15, and following where it talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, John first feels the need to introduce you to who God is apart from you and me. And that's humbling uh, because suddenly you realize God is eternal. And yes, he has redeemed me, who I exist in time and space and whatnot, but he does not. <laughs> and so why, why, do, why am I, you know, belaboring this? Well, Augustine, the father, when he was countering many of the subordinationists of his day, he was quite frustrated. And he said, it's as if they don't pay attention to the different distinctions 
that Scripture may. So you think of Philippians 2, for example. Augustine, just following the Apostle Paul, said, well, Paul seems to distinguish between Jesus in the form of God and Jesus in the form of a servant. Hmm. And Augustine went on, so there, there even seems to be a third category, which is other texts, especially in John's Gospel, that refer to the Son being sent by the Father, and so on. The point is, what's Augustine doing? He's helping the Bible reader understand that we can't conflate God in and of himself with everything that's just happening to me in history. Uh, that's and good stuff. <laughs> if you do that, suddenly, you naturally, you end up in with subordinationism because yeah. you take what happens, what you see happening in the Gospels, for example, for the very specific purpose, which is to accomplish salvation, and map that on to the Son and the Father, or even the Holy Spirit, too, in and of themselves. And that's why you end up, you know, with some of those statements like what you said about how, oh, well, to be father is just authority and son is the inferior. Well, that's actually a terrible misreading of what it means to be father and son. But more basically, that really doesn't do justice the way we read the Bible, yeah. the God of the Bible. So that's the first thing that to be said. The traditional way of making this distinction is there is theology, God of himself, and then there is the economy, what takes place in history for the sake of our salvation and, and much more. In the 20th century, that distinction begins to, to erode, mm-hmm. and that conflation between those categories begins. Carl Rahner is really famous for this when he says, well, the imminent trinity is the economic trinity, and the economic trinity is the imminent trinity. Suddenly, it, it begins to vanish there. Yeah. Uh, EFS, I think, at its heart, makes this mistake because it will go to the Bible and it will read what's taking place in the mission of the Son, and it will assume that what is happening there needs to be mapped on to the Son apart from the world. That is the same hermeneutical move that was made in the fourth century by different subordination, just with more radical outcomes. Yeah. In our day, this is where it's kind of ironic, right? Because, you know, an EFSer will say, oh, well, I'm not indebted to modern theology or social Trinitarianism. But actually, that's the same move <laughs> that's been made by modern theologians. They just had a different agenda. Right. So they would flight those categories, and they would then move to, say, politics, Whereas EFS wants to move to gender instead. It's just a different agenda. Yeah. That's all. But it's the same social trend that's operating in the background. Well, it becomes quite easy then to say, well, if the father is authority and the son is subordinate, though they will call and say functionally subordinate, well, then there's our paradigm for authority and submission in marriage, the church, and, and perhaps for some even society itself. So that maneuver is a costly one. The problem, and I think of Augustine, you know, if we were bringing him back today, I think he would say, hey, why are we not paying attention to the New Testament? Does it not say that the son humbled himself to the point of death? Uh, does it not say that the son learned obedience by what he suffered? In other words, obedience is not something that's true of the son apart from the world and the incarnation and the, the uh, mission of salvation. No, it's something that happens for that context specifically, only a means of the Son actually assuming a human nature and taking on human flesh, as we might say. The last thing I'll say here is there's a more fundamental reason why this is so pivotal to orthodoxy. Because as soon as you map any type of subordinationism into the imminent life of the Godhead, whether it's with the Son or the Holy Spirit, EFS will deny this no way around it. You have to have multiple wills in the Trinity yeah. to explain how there can be, apart from the world, within God himself, even if it's functional, how there can be this subordination of one person to another. You have to have multiple wills. This is deadly because at that point, the burden's on that person to explain how they avoid tritheism. This is exactly why the church fathers were so careful to say, you no know, Father, Son, and Spirit They're distinguished by these eternal relations of origin alone. And then very quickly, they followed that up to say, so they are one. What unites them? Well, they are one in essence, will, power, and glory. Man, just hearing you talk and hearing the importance of the Trinity in our Christian lives is so important. I mean, really digging down to understanding who the Godhead is. You are so right that. We are lacking this in our churches today, talking about this on a regular basis. So I mentioned the whole complementarian thing. 
I'm only going to bring this up again just because a lot of my listeners have been through a lot of that and mm, and yeah. just the effects of it. And mm. man, the problem that I have, I'm not saying that there aren't points to be made from scripture, but the thing that's hard for me is the guys making all the points or the guys that are using biblicist arguments and using EFS to argue for complementarianism, yeah, which is why it's something yeah, that, I, it's, again, I'm struggling through. And I, I want to be able to help my listeners to know that, you know, questioning some of these things is okay, and it might be a good thing. <laughs> so go ahead and comment yeah. on that. Yeah, no, it is really important. The tragedy of it all is, you know, back when this stuff really started to take root, so many experienced this firsthand. I can't tell you how many pastors I know or pastors that have just reached out to me every week, <laughs> every month to this day. I bet. Saying, I was taught this. I was taught that this is not just Bible, but this is how to be faithful in your marriage or in your church as a pastor towards. Well, I'll even women. go so far to say that a lot of people are taught that this is such an issue that if you don't believe it, then you're not a Christian. I've heard that. That's it. Yeah. I mean, the rhetoric really, it really gets taken quite far. The point I want to make is when this was really happening, so often the Trinity becomes the ace card in the deck. Yeah. Right. And you could see how this would happen. So suddenly there's, there's no other answer. There's no way to respond to that when, you know, if you want to talk about complementarianism, well, of course, because we know that the Trinity is authority and submission. So case is closed. And the tragedy of this all is it's completely unnecessary. (laughs) When you look at history, goodness, for all of history, they too thought about what does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? Uh, What does that mean in marriage? What does that mean in the church? That means society. None of that was lost on them, but they did not appeal to the Trinity. And I think if we go back to the Bible itself, the Bible doesn't give us justification for doing that. Right. What does the Bible present to us? It presents to us the incarnate Christ who, after his suffering and his resurrection and his exaltation, well, here Christ is able to be put forward to us, and we are told, wow, look at his love for his bride. Amen. Well, that's a very yeah. different paradigm altogether. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. That's not appealing to the Trinity, but it's appealing to the love of Christ and his passion and his suffering for his bride so that she is covered with his very blood. Well, I suppose what I'm trying to say to folks out there, if they're wrestling with this, you don't have to go there. You don't have to go to the Trinity to somehow to argue these things. Hands off the Trinity. Uh, <laughs> Amen. Rather, you have an abundance in Scripture that deals with issues like sex and gender and what it means to be male or female head on without having to manipulate the Trinity to you know win that argument. It's almost um, in a sense they're invoking God in order to make a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, that's where I think it's, again, this comes back to how we read the Bible, but it affects how we understand the life of the church. And I would say, especially the pastors out there, if you've experienced that, maybe God is calling on pastors now to set forward a much better example. Um, because that these things aren't to be addressed. Uh, your people do need to hear about what what does it mean to be a husband and a wife? Absolutely, that needs to be addressed. Sunday school or sometimes in the pulpit, you're going to come across the text and you, you need to address it. But you need to set the right example how to do it. Yeah. And if you operate by the rules of social Trinitarianism, well, then you're going to be looking Trinity to somehow be the model, the paradigm to win that argument, but that's not the maneuver of, of the Bible itself makes. So my encouragement to folks out there would be, hey, let's strive for a better way to approach these important issues so that on the one hand, we don't mess with the doctrine of God and, and go down unorthodox paths. And on the other hand, we are able actually to have a healthy conversation about sex and gender that's not so muddied by this history. Amen. I appreciate throughout this whole conversation, the fact that the conflation of categories and biblicism is like at the center of it, you know, bad hermeneutics mm, and conflating categories. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've had him say it on my podcast that he's said it in his own podcast, but Pat Abendroth, and I always, I like to quote him every so often, but he always says categories, categories, categories. It's yeah. important to have proper categories. So Absolutely. Well, brother, this has been a great conversation. I am so thankful for just all of the 
great meat <laughs> that you brought to us today with understanding some of these things. I, I mean, we could talk about the Trinity for weeks and weeks and weeks and still never get it all figured out, but it's wonderful to be able to give my listeners some really good historical Trinitarian orthodoxy, you know, mm. and, and God pill them, so to speak. <laughs> you know, they talk about red pill yeah. people. We want to God pill people here and just get them on board with understanding that, you know, the doctrine of God is huge. And I really appreciate mm. your appeal to the pastors out there because they need to hear this, yeah. you know, they need to be encouraged and not to give up and to keep searching. How'd you like to go ahead and share uh, your website, your uh, podcast, magazine, yeah. all of those great things? Yeah, well, I, the first thing I've said, if listeners, you know, we've really only touched the tip of the iceberg here. Go read Simply Trinity. Yeah, um, It's a book yeah. I've written with uh, Baker Books. I've written it to be accessible. So if you're a theologically hungry churchgoer or a pastor out there, maybe you're a student, I really hope that you'll find it accessible and it'll introduce you to those categories Amen. that might open your eyes and really do a whole new world out there. And so I really hope it can be of service to you. And then check out uh, credomag.com. We have so many resources for you. I do a podcast as well, the Credo Podcast. We also have upcoming conferences. You're going to want to keep your eyes on that exciting speakers that are really doing what we did here, trying to reintroduce the church to Christian orthodoxy in a way that is really healthy. So go check out credomag.com. Amen. Well, we appreciate it very much. And brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm so thankful that you joined us today. These are the kind of conversations that need to be had among us as Christians. And I hope it's been encouraging. I know there was a lot of heady theological stuff and church history stuff that we don't normally delve into unless, of course, we're doing theology for the broken church. But I think this was just a wonderful conversation. I hope you listen to it a couple of times just to take it all in, because I think there was a lot of important things said. And if you're struggling through understanding some of this stuff, like our brother said, read his books, listen to his podcast, and just keep searching and engage at the Broken Vessels Podcast Facebook group. We got a lot of people that would love to engage with you on some of the questions that you might have on episodes that we've uh, discussed some of these types of things. Brothers and sisters in Christ, rest in Jesus, rest in Christ, look to Christ, who is fully God. Thank you so much for joining us. (laughs) 